A big part of effective design when we're talking about interactivity is about reducing complexity wherever possible. However, there is also a, a kind of core complexity that cannot be reduced inherent in any interaction or engagement with a user. And that core complexity or inherent complexity needs to either be absorbed by the user or the device or design. Deciding which one all comes down to Tesla's law. So Tesla's law all comes down to who has the burden of complexity the user or the kind of designer stroke developer end of the equation. And this seems like an, an obvious question, right? The designer and developer should deal with the complexity, the user should get the benefit. But there's actually only so far you can simplify things. And sometimes, certainly in the L&D space, we are guilty of kind of treating our learners with, with kiddie gloves. We forget that these are people. They can handle the real world. They're used to consequences and maybe not knowing everything straight away. And so some level of complexity is not only you know, necessary, but actually good from a learning perspective. If everything's easy, well, there's no challenge. It's more about deciding which pieces of complexity the designer and developer should take away and which pieces of complexity should be left with the user is deciding where the burden sits. So, as we always do now, let's start by taking a look at the history of Tesla's law. So Tesla's law dates back to the kind of mid 1980s, um, where they were looking to design a kind of universal language for interactivity, something that would take away all the unnecessary complexity out of interaction and allow the user to focus on that inherent complexity that couldn't be reduced or mitigated. And this led them to looking at things like uh, button styles, use of iconography versus labeled buttons, uh, layouts, uh, even right down to fonts, number, shape and size of screens. Uh, and this eventually was given over to Apple as the law of conservation. Um, really about making sure people are putting their energy into the right places and that the designer and developer make things as easy as possible for the user. And Apple is a really interesting example of this. So um, let's take a look at them as a real world example. So for a long time, Apple's tagline was, it just works. And they came out with all their kind of magic this and magic that, be it magic mouse, magic keyboard, magic link, magic everything else they've done. Um, and I'm not a huge Apple fan at all, but this is one area within the kind of user experience world where they have excelled. Their products are exceptionally easy to set up get access to and connect to one another, creating a kind of seamless ecosystem, conserving user energy for the complexities that the user needs to tackle, i.e. deciding what your password's going to be, as opposed to figuring out how to set the password in the first place. Apple do this with incredible simplicity. You'll notice that pretty much every version of Mac OS, since it became a truly uh, kind of graphical interface, kind of Windows-esque, has been pretty much the same. There have been some minor aesthetic changes, transparencies, color shifts, that kind of thing. But broadly speaking, the interface has maintained the same basic building blocks, the same basic user experience principles and layouts. And this means that a user can move from one generation of devices to another or update their software without having to gain a whole new level of complexity and relearn things. It conserves their energy and their effort to the use and their uh, kind of implementation of Apple's content and software rather than figuring out how to use it. You look at the opposite end of the spectrum uh, and people who use Linux, where a lot of energy has to go into figuring out you know, which version are you going to run and which package manager are you going to install? Are you going to have a different uh, graphic UI to your background content? And there's so many decisions to make. Um, and they take a completely different view of it because it's for people who want those complexities. They give you the option of just do this and you get everything as we've set it up or do it yourself. 
Apple opts for a much more prescriptive, this is the quote unquote Apple way of doing things, uh, where everything is seamless for everyone, everyone gets the same experience, but it doesn't broadly go wrong. Another great example of this are email clients. You look at Gmail and you kind of think, well, it's just an email client. But there are lots of small things within Gmail that are designed to minimize complexity for the user and take those things and hand them off to the developer and designer. Predictive text when you're writing an email, guessing how the sentence is going to end and offering that as a one-click solution. Um, email addresses. Remembering email addresses can be a nightmare. So when you type the first couple of letters or the first bit of someone's name in or the start of an email address, it'll pop up and say, oh, is this the email address you're looking for? You click it, take it away. All reducing user complexity and moving that burden onto the developer and designer. These are the things that seem very small because we're very used to them now, but if they went away tomorrow, we would quickly notice. Suddenly having to remember email addresses or open that old style to address book, scroll down and find them. Um, you know, it would massively slow us down. These things in very small ways allow us to complete simple tasks quickly, easily, without expending effort. So. Let's take a look at how Tesla's door can be applied within the world of learning design. So first things first, it's really important to remember that within every interaction, no matter how big or small, how complex or how simple it may appear to be, there will be a core or inherent level of complexity that cannot be reduced or mitigated, no matter how good the design. That core or you know, that, that, that immovable complexity either has to sit with the user to deal with or the kind of system, platform, the developer, the designer, whoever is in the right place to deal with it internally. Neither one is wrong, but you must know which is the case. Splitting it is not generally a, 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 an option. The most common example of this is you can make an interface as simple as possible, but the user's still got to answer the question in your quiz. That inherent core complexity has to sit with the user. What you can do is get out of their way. If it's up to them, let it be up to them. Don't try and you know, muscle in with additional unnecessary hint buttons and helps and all these things unless they are absolutely essential. The next thing is to really look at your content and ensure that wherever possible, the burden is lifted from the user and taken onto you, the designer, the developer, the instructional designer in this case. Um, really look for opportunities to make the user's life as easy as possible. Uh, a prime example of this is you want to pull their name through from the LMS or you want to have their name used throughout the entire course. Historically, this might mean at the very start you ask them to type in their name. Well, that works, but that complexity now sits with the user. So instead, why not use an XAPI statement to pull the name from the LMS? You could also do that with JavaScript if, uh, you know, if, if you're not using yeah, XAPI in your content. Um, but look for those, those kinds of opportunities. When filling out a quiz, rather than asking them to remember the score of their first attempt when they go through a second time if they didn't pass, show it for them on screen. Just, just put it in as a first attempt, second attempt on each screen um, with just a, just a quick reference back to their previous results. It's one less thing they have to think about. Telling them what question number they're on in the quiz is another classic one. Not knowing, you know, I know I've got five questions, but is this question three or is this question four? Whether it's a simple visual indicator, whether it's a number in the corner, tell them where they are in the process. Next up, think about iconography, buttons, links. Um, it's all a big debate. Make sure whatever you use is totally clear and understandable. The more intuitive, the better. Often we think, oh, iconography is the way to go. But I use Twitter as a prime example here. If, when I, because when you hover over all the little Twitter icons for retweet and comment and all that kind of thing, um, if you hover over them, it tells you what it is. And that's because the icons are not very intuitive. Um, that little retweet icon could be reload, it could be refresh, 
Um, retweet is, is a Twitter specific term, but they've not used a Twitter specific icon. Um, you look at when Google recently changed over all the kind of colored icons for its applications, and they all kind of now look the same. And it causes a real problem. They're beautifully designed. They're, they're really nice pieces of graphic design or artwork more so, but very, very poor user experience consideration in that all your icons now look the same. So finding the calendar versus Meet versus Gmail is harder than it's ever been. Finally, Whilst we want to simplify user interfaces, be sure not to simplify them to the point of abstraction. There is a point to what you're trying to do for the all users. They're there to learn something specific. Make sure you're never simplifying beyond the point where they can still get the content into their brain. Oversimplification can be even more damaging than additional complexity at times. Specifically in terms of UI, it can be very tempting to start to carve away some of those added extras um, and forget that for some people, they aren't just an added extra, they're essential. A closed captions button, the ability to uh, stop and start video or skip through video using a seek bar, the, uh, the, the video sizing and the screen sizing tools that we now have in uh, products like Storyline and, and Captivate to resize for different accessibility needs, tab orders. These things are easy to think, oh, well, I'll just cut down on complexity and remove them. But you're kind of taking away complexity for you and for some users, but for the users who need those things, you've not only made the course more complex, you may actually have made the course completely inaccessible. So always balance the need to reduce complexity with the understanding that there will be an inherent core complexity you can never reduce, minimize, mitigate, get rid of. And at that point, you have to decide, does it sit with the user? Does it sit with you? Wherever possible, it should sit with you and you should take it off their plate. But where it does sit with them, that's fine. Complexity is not a vice. You just need to know who it belongs to. Hopefully you found this video useful. Uh, if you did and you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. That really, really helps me out. You can find loads more details about these topics in the description of the episode. And of course, if you didn't like this, uh, you should watch it again at 75% speed and see if that helps you out. Thank you.